Hello, this is Matt. Kose. Mark. Guillaume. James. Mel. Zach. This is David. Terrier. This is PSG Talking. Le seul podcast sur le PSG en anglais. Hello and welcome to the latest installment of PSG Talking. I'm your host, Ed, and on today's show, we're recapping what might have been the most chaotic week in the world of football, probably since 2017 when Neymar decided to leave Barcelona for Paris Saint-Germain. Joining me on today's show, we have Matt Gooding in the UK and Mark Damon in New York. I don't know if I've had you guys both on at the same time before, so this should be fun. First, let's check in with you guys. How are you all doing? Matt, how are you? Yeah, I'm well, thanks, mate. I'm uh, living my best football life at the moment because Cambridge United are on the verge of promotion, which is amazing. And uh, I know you guys are all rooting for them. And uh, obviously, PSG are now the moral compass of world football. So, you know, what could be better? Are they? What league is Cambridge United in? Cambridge United are in League Two, so it's like the fourth tier of English football. So we're heading. We need one more win out of three games, and we'll be heading for the third tier. So this is all right. All really you, exciting. All you are listening, pull for Cambridge United. Yeah, I, know I will. Up the U's. That's up right. The up, U's. up the U's. Up the U's. <laughs> and uh, Mark, how are things on your end? Rangers doing well this season? Um, the, not the, the Scottish the, Rangers. Um, it's uh, no. the hockey, the, hockey Rangers. The hockey Rangers. Yeah, um, they're a little bit out of the playoffs right now, mm. but um, they're a fun team to watch. So it's, it's okay. entertaining. It. it you know, win or lose, it's entertaining. They're not they're not a boring team. They got good players around. But it's it's good over here in New York. Um, do, do they say up the R's? No, that's <laughs> no. not that's not a, that is not an American thing. Maybe you could maybe you could start it, Mark. It'd be yeah. quite funny. I, I don't know if people would go along with it, but I could definitely try and see how far that gets me. <laughs> All right, guys, let's just get right into it because Super League. Um, Mark, you and I recorded a 1970 podcast. I believe it was like the day when the Super League madness had broke, and we we kind of it was just... like just when it was a, a being yeah. announced. So like we sort of gave <laughs> that was before it was actually official, official, right? Um, and so essentially, the signal that these clubs sent by deciding to do this was that you know that they, they were in a, a dire financial situation, and. Uh, <laughs> We know that, you know, with Barcelona and even Tottenham, they're drowning in debt, um, mostly Tottenham due to their stadium. I mean, do you guys sympathize with some of these teams at all, or do you really blame them for poor management? Um, we can start with you, Matt, if you'd like, um, since we were talking about Tottenham and you're in the UK, maybe you have a inside track to this. But do you have any sympathy for some of these clubs at all for doing what they did? Uh, I mean, Tottenham, <laughs> Tottenham recently appointed Jose Mourinho, like... <laughs> so I have no sympathy for anything which happens to them. They totally deserve anything that's coming. I think the idea of having this European Super League with all the best teams and having Spurs and Arsenal in it is absolutely hilarious. It's probably the funniest thing about the whole project, to be honest. Um, but no, I don't have any sympathy for them, really. I mean, the, you know, COVID-19, you know, hit everybody, hasn't it? And, you know, all industries, including football. So, uh I, I, so maybe I have a little bit of sympathy, but really that it's not the way to go about it to basically break the whole uh, order of football and the, you know, the, the structure of football that's existed for years and years and actually works quite well a lot of the time just for their own sort of um, their own personal gain. And I think, I mean, they that maybe they'll blame it on the current situation that they found themselves in, which was a bit out of their control. But I think for some of them, this has been a bit of a hobby horse for a while, hasn't it? Particularly you think of the Juventus um, owner who seems obsessed with uh, you know, get a new way out of the or into a, some other new league where they can they can profit more or what have you. So no, I I mean I think it's it's a <laughs> entirely a move motivated by greed. I think that you know they could they're in they've got bad financial circumstances. Well, big deal. Loads of people have just still that don't like try and run away and, and start your own uh, weird competition, which. There's no evidence that there's any demand for anyway. I mean, there's a lot of problems with the Super League idea, I think, in general, which we might come on to later. But yeah, yeah. certainly my uh, my sympathy is, is, is extremely limited. 
Yeah, and I, I do apologize. You know, hosting isn't the easiest thing in the world. I did skip my initial question, which I can ask. I'll go to Mark now and ask that question. Then, Matt, we can come back to you. But my initial question I wanted to ask is the superleague.com is still active, the website. Uh, and it features yeah. the logos of all the teams, all the origini- original 12 uh, clubs who founded it that have now most of them have since left. But, Mark, do you think we've seen the last of the Super League? <sighs> Yeah, I think there's a, a, a couple of ways to look at this. It, not to be too long-winded, but there's a few there's a few avenues you can take with this. I think the first thing is that, and I think I've called it this on Twitter. I'm not sure if I've called this on Twitter, but I've called it the worst good idea in sports history. And what I mean by that is, in theory, as a long-term economic project, the concept of a top-tier league where more good teams play each other and that money somehow trickles down to the lower tiers without the interference of UEFA is not on paper the worst idea anyone has ever put together. The problem is, and Matt just touched on it, you can't sell a product that nobody wants to buy. So nobody wanted it and they didn't want it then, especially. So you have these teams who have this strong sort of financial incentive to get into this league and to get a what is essentially a quick infusion of cash about the quickest infusion of cash you can get jp morgan just give us the money give us you know give us 500 million euros and and we can cover our book balance for the next year wasn't jp morgan uh wasn't he like yeah it was jp morgan but he's like the Monopoly man. That's who the, the Monopoly guy is based off of, isn't it? Yes. You talk uh, about if, money. If you want a history lesson, <laughs> yes. James Piermont Morgan was a financial uh, – he was uh, – what would he be today? He'd be like the Bill Gates. I was going to say like Zuckerberg time. or something. Like yeah, that. he's like the Bill – more like the Bill Gates of the 1880s, 1890s. Okay. So the, the idea is, again, it's quick infusion of cash because – to sort of go into another analogy, it's like in 2008 when all the banks failed. The banks didn't expect for all those loans that they underwrote for those for those uh, for the housing bubble in the early 2000s to just collapse all at the same time. So the question is, all these banks and all these financial companies are going broke. What do you do? Do you let them fail, or do you bail them out with an infusion of cash? And the United States decided to bail them all out with money. They bailed out the automakers. They bailed out the the housing lenders. They bailed out the banks. So I think these clubs see their financial situation, and they go, we need a quick infusion of cash right now. And the best way to do that is to come out with a really – you know, to sort of pull out the idea of the Super League, because Super League's the idea has been around for years now. It's something we've talked about and joked about on this show multiple times of, you know, hey, PSG aren't getting a raw deal and getting a raw deal in Liga and let's go, you know, let's go form the Super League so we don't have to play Angers every day. Like we've, we've made that joke. Yeah. But, you know, when it's actually sort of a, a real LLC that has like a website and announcements, mm-hmm. it gets real for people. And I and. The, I think we'll kind of get into this part, which is the, the visceral anger at this idea is unlike anything I've ever seen in sports. I, I don't know if there's an analogy that you didn't can, see when, can... when Tennessee football fans wanted to get rid of uh, Greg Schiano, they rose up. That's similar. No, that's, that's this is, this is a different <laughs> level. This is like, yeah. you have presidents of countries, you have prime ministers you have monarchs going out against this idea. There was not, there was literally, I can't think of one person besides Florentino Perez mm-hmm. who actually went out into public and said, yay, the Super League is a good idea. Literally, I've never heard of an idea that everyone hated as much as this. And you saw but that today we'll with, to- with, with Arsenal fans protesting outside of the Emirates yeah, Stadium. They and want they their out two around. Ago, yeah. And they're still mad. Yeah. Well, Matt, let me go to you and ask that same question. Do you think we've seen the last of the Super League? Do you think the reaction there, especially in England, do you think there's any way that this idea will ever be floated again? Um, I think that it's, I think sort of Mark sort of mentioned it there. It's been around for ages, probably even like since the 1980s or something. I think they first started talking about it. So no, I don't, unfortunately, don't think it's gone away because 
there's too many people with a vested interest who would like to make it work and maybe yeah uh maybe man city and chelsea particularly of the english teams don't want it don't need it basically for similar reasons to maybe some of the reasons that psg don't need it uh but i think manchester united and liverpool clearly would quite like it to happen and the spanish clubs and the italian clubs would like it to happen so no i think that they'll they'll probably bide their time they'll probably think about what they haven't done very well in this case which is (laughs) <laughs> well pretty much everything but I don't think that will put them off because I think these people yeah. genuinely think it's uh, an idea that has merit and uh, an idea which can make their organizations you know financially better off so unfortunately I think it'll it'll be coming around again probably quite soon but what do you think about Mark's point about you know the 2008 uh, housing crisis and the bailout you look at some of these teams you know talking about Arsenal Barcelona we know their debt issues it seems like there needs to be some sort of bailout. And a lot of the issue is kind of self-inflicted. A lot of these teams did it to themselves, Barcelona buying Coutinho and these other players for way too much money. Do you yeah. think that there needs to be some kind of bailout? Or do you think if, if a club mm. you know, goes into bankruptcy or whatever, what, what do they call bankruptcy? Yeah, bankruptcy. And, uh, bankruptcy. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. no, I didn't. They had like when a team is insolvent or something like that. What do they call it in England? Administration. Administration. Uh, yeah. Administration. Yeah. Yeah. Where I mean, to, well. is that do we just need to let teams go into administration? Maybe not. Maybe these big well, teams will never get there. But like, mm-hmm. I don't know. This well, is this is what I was going to say. So yeah. I think that the uh, analogy with the financial crisis is, is a is a pretty good one. But I think that where it differs is that there's no nobody's like a you know a, a fan of like you're not like a diehard fan of Lehman Brothers are you or like um you know <laughs> no one's going to come out and think oh, I've Hold supported I'm get my Lehman Brothers, Brothers jersey on yeah, hold on <laughs> exactly exactly so I think like there's very <laughs> little chance that like Juventus or Real Madrid goes out of business because there's always going to be they've got so many fans around the world someone rich will step in it in their hour of need and save them so what this was about was them maintaining their current status where they have like where they're paying Ronaldo like zillions of pounds or they're paying Messi zillions of dollars or euros or whatever um uh and not having any difficulties but you know unfortunately uh that's when you're when you're um a business and you get into you get into financial problems and your outgoings are much higher than your incomings you know you've got to do something about it and I think so no, I don't think there should be particularly a bailout. I don't particularly for those top level clubs where they have still have quite high levels of income through all their various commercial activities and through their TV deals and what have you. I think they just need to uh, do something about their outgoings, which are massive, which they can impact. I know, like, you know, teams get stuck with players that they can't shift from time to time. But maybe that's the um, the reorganisation which needs to happen in football is to look at you know the the massive outgoings which they spend on their on their teams and if if you can't afford them if it, if your if your model's completely unsustainable then you need to you need to do something about it and not you know throw your toys out of the pram and go and start your own league because because you want to you want to keep your you want to keep your really expensively assembled squad so i'm no i'm not i'm not massively keen on on bailouts to be honest particularly for top level football because certainly what we see in the uk is that there's loads of money at the top level and not a lot of it filters down to the lower levels and the money that does filter down often comes heavily caveated like they will put in some kind of you know new rules around youth players for example where the Premier League can basically just take your good youth players without having to pay any compensation and stuff so Hmm. I feel like there's a lot of money in top level football the fact that it is not at the moment moving to the right places as far as the big clubs are concerned is not something which should be should not be bothering the rest of us. Frankly, they need to they need to get their own houses in order and, and find ways around it. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I'll, and Go I'll ahead, make Mark. this yeah I'll make this point too. And just that, you know, I think we've learned with PSG over the years with their sort of uh, issues with financial fair play and in the you know I think as as fans of PSG we sort of pay attention to the financials more than let's say other clubs that don't sort of have that microscope on them but you know high level football doesn't necessarily operate at profit like it's not a business model that necessarily um is conducive to making a lot of sort of you make a lot of money, but you don't necessarily retain all that money because there's so much expense going out. You'd be better off investing in Dogecoin than buying a Premier League <laughs> team. 
No, but it's on. not. It, again, you look at a team like Tottenham, for example. Like, you know, y- you can you can be sustainable at, at White Hart Lane and and you know have a stadium that's sort of smaller, maybe than your fan base maybe requires. But then you go build this huge stadium, and they're still, you know, not even close to paying the thing off. Like, there's just a lot of expense. So the fact that these top level clubs basically you know, keep their team going on a credit card from, you know, month to month, year to year. And then you get a year where there are no fans in the stands for an entire year. You lose all that revenue. You lose the game day revenue, which is, you know, it's not the, it's not the only thing that you have to worry about. But again, think about it. You lose all the merchandise you sell at games, all the fans who come and buy really expensive tickets to these really expensive clubs. And I'm not necessarily saying that these that this again, who can foresee a global pandemic that shuts the world down for a year? You really that's my dog, by the way. Um, <laughs> hey, puppy. He, yeah, he's he's, he's, he's saying I first saw the pandemic. Yeah. He's, they say yeah, dogs can smell yeah. things coming. <laughs> but yeah, but it's like, how do you how do you foresee that? So when something like this happens and the clubs, you know, get into this spot. I think they got desperate and desperate people do not so smart things. And I, I look at the super league and go, yeah, would it be the worst idea to have this league in some form someday, you know, with the possibility of sort of growing the game out, having these big matches all over the world and, you know, having these TV deals that would hopefully go down to the lower levels, which it probably wouldn't, but Hey, you can dream, you could have it in theory. But then to, you know, we can start getting into why this didn't work. And I think besides the visceral anger of the fans, and I think we can speak to that too, I think the main reason this didn't work is because they genuinely believed that they could shock and awe their way through this as opposed to actually doing the sort of legwork. Like, if you're going to do a coup, you have to have your ducks in order for the coup to work. Like, a coup doesn't work when 10 people decide to overthrow the government, as powerful as those 10 people might be. Like, you need everybody, you need to have FIFA on your side. You need to have the domestic leagues on your side. You need to have so much more goodwill built up, as opposed to just saying, us 12 are going to go out and do this. And you're all going to fall in line because we're the big, powerful clubs. And, you know, you can't you're nothing without us. And I think it was pretty clear early on that UEFA, FIFA, all the domestic leagues were pretty much in agreement that, no, this is a bad idea and we don't want it. So. When you're going against that, when you're going that far out on the limb, usually the limb breaks. And I, I think when you don't have that backing you know even if you have you know billions of dollars from jp morgan if you don't have the administrative bureaucratic muscle to pull it off and to you know and to guarantee that those players wouldn't have been banned from from foreign comp from international competitions to sort of you know to be able to do this move with confidence and not just sort of have Florentino Perez go on Spanish radio and ramble for an hour to, to try to sell the thing, you know, talk about how all the hip young kids these days don't watch football like they used to. You have the 73 year old man saying that, you know, we have to go, you know, shorten the games like yeah, n- no PR wing. They barely had a social media presence. No one that they could send out there could explain what the hell the thing was and why they needed it. Yeah. And it's like they it was like dinosaurs who thought that they could sort of put out a press release, then do an interview 24 hours after the press release and then, you know, sort of think that that's enough. Like by the time Florentino Perez got to a microphone, pretty much everyone had said they hated the idea. There was no way he could turn that ship around, even though he was never even close to turning the ship around, even if he gave the best interview he could ever give. It already been 
30 hours of people shitting all over the idea. And he, so, he's going down with the Titanic, though. He He's not going anywhere. He, he's a he's a proud man. He's the he's the guy. He's the violin player on the Titanic as it's going down. But it's a it's just it's just the worst PR disaster. Yeah. And that's why I was hoping we would have um, Pola on our team come on because she was talking on the Discord all about the PR angle and how poorly done it was and and so um, but we'll have to get her on a future show. But Matt, I wanted to ask you because you, you've got two Americans here and we Mark and I grew up with the Cleveland Browns in the National Football League just always sucking for the most part. But they always remained in the NFL. And so what I wanted to ask you is that is a very American model um, for a sports league where teams really don't get relegated. There's really no punishment for sucking. In fact, you're actually rewarded because the Browns would get good draft picks. And so you have a lot you have a lot of owners uh, who are American that own Yeah. Yeah, there's literally in the NF in in sports in America now, there's Mm -hmm. literally the idea of tanking. Yeah. Where you intentionally suck. So oh, that so you, you can, can eventually get, get better. Pick. Yeah, someone out of college. So, I mean, do you ever do you think that model is that what turned fans yeah. off? There's, there's no punishment for sucking that you don't have to try. You're just always going to make millions of dollars just for being mediocre. Yeah. I certainly think in England. I can't speak for other countries, but I think in England that idea that you can go from the uh, from the fourth division uh, or from lo- even lower right up into the Premier League is quite a uh, powerful sort of part of the football story because it is a nice narrative and also because you want to think that your team could one day like like be there and we've seen examples in recent years like Bournemouth from Swansea who I remember playing Cambridge United like in my lifetime like say the last 10 or 15 years who have gone to the Premier League done just that so I think that it, there's certainly a bit of a bit of that about the English opposition and the strong like fan reaction you saw because you're basically you're splitting the football pyramid off and you're saying, right, you, Cambridge United or Bournemouth or whoever will never be able to play in this league because you just, you're not interested enough as far as we're concerned. Um, but it felt like that we were, I mean, I'm not an American, as a regular listeners know, I'm not an American sports fan by any uh, measure, but it felt like we were getting all the worst bits of it because there was no suggestion there was going to be a draft, was there? So you'd get into the Super League, but and if you came bottom, you wouldn't like get the first pick of you won't get to have Messi the following season the clubs would just keep their players and like uh you'd still be crap and you'd still be at the bottom basically so I think fans would have um, liked it if there was like a fantasy draft yeah. so you would take all those 12 teams take all the players in a pool and then you just pick who goes first and then yeah you're right I'll take Messi yeah. I'll take Ronaldo I'll take you know yeah. whoever I think so I think if you'd made it perhaps for their one of their future iterations perhaps that's what they need to do but also I think as well, we've talked to the, we've talked about this as a reaction to a crisis, as something which has been driven by the fact that they're all skint. But I think for the uh, I think particularly for the owners of Manchester United and Liverpool, who both come from sort of an American sports background, as you guys I'm sure know, probably quite like the idea of it being a profitable business and not like Mark was saying earlier, being an industry where you you can't make money. Because you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think NFL owners quite regularly do quite nicely out of their teams right and oh, yeah. Yeah. we've seen the glazers over and over with manchester united they've loaded manchester united with debt and they take millions out every year in dividends and i think perhaps the ownership at liverpool as well see the super league route as a model where it would enable them to to run liverpool and manchester united and also make a profit from it uh which clearly is not something which is compatible with the the sort of strong fan feelings which we which we've yeah. just discussed so I think there's an element of there is an element of crisis management. There's also an element of them basically wanting to get richer and seeing them seeing this is a good way to do it. Yeah, and and the reason that the the American sports model can work, there's actually really there's two ways you can do it, which is you have a salary cap where teams can only spend a certain amount of money on players. So if you have a salary cap, it keeps the owners' cost down. So if I can only spend $150 million on players, I can only I can spend less than that, but I don't have to spend more than that. So you can make a, an American sports franchise profitable by staying under the salary cap and being good and having revenues from all the other streams. The other yeah. way to do it in the way baseball does it in America is but something called the luxury tax. So what the luxury tax does is if you spend over a certain amount of money, there's no actual salary cap. But you have to pay a tax that then goes to the other teams that don't spend as much as you do. 
So there's sort of a wealth, there's a rev, there's an idea of revenue sharing. And that's basically what these American sports leagues do. There's an idea of, you know, you're 32 owners or 30 owners or 31 owners, and you all buy a franchise and you all, you all sort of make decisions on a basis of all of you. So if there's 31 owners, there's 31 votes. And, you know, if, all the revenue that comes in then gets split. So everyone gets an equal amount of the television revenue. Everyone gets an equal amount of, of, you know, of any of everything. And then, you know, you have to bargain with the players of how much the players get of the revenue. So you think of it like a big pie, the owners get 60% of the revenue and the players get 40% of the revenue. Uh, world football is not like that. European football <laughs> is absolutely the complete opposite model of that. Yeah, Meaning if sure. you, you know, you know, if you have the money, you spend it, you know, if you want to pay, if you want to pay, you know, if you can cover the cost, you can pay all these, you know, mediocre to maybe above average players, 10, 15 million euros a year. And it doesn't really, there's no real penalty for that in the short term. It's not like you have to stay on a budget, you know, you, you set your own budget. And what that's done is it's inflated the it's inflated the salaries to a point where yeah these these uh, these owners have had to splurge for these players mm -hmm. and you you try to put something like financial fair play into the mix yeah. to solve that problem but the it really doesn't because it's all sort of financial it's all sort of a it, it's a magic trick in essence if you have enough sponsors if you have enough revenue regardless of where you, that revenue ends up going, you can buy all these players because it shows up on the books that you're, you're even when in reality you're sort of not quite even. It's not, it's not a hard salary cap. There's nothing really stopping these clubs from spending money. So from that perspective, this was sort of bound to happen at some point. There was going to be something that happened, whether it be a pandemic or a financial crisis, or there was always going to be something down the line that happened where these clubs were going to have to pay this toll eventually. And, yeah. you know, I, I think, I think that sort of justifies their thinking to an extent, but then also you, as, as Matt has put, it's not, you know, it's not our fault. You, your business isn't profitable. It's not our fault that you're 20 million euros in the hole. So why do we have to then suffer for it? And I think what happened in those 48 hours is that players, coaches, fans, I think they felt an existential threat to what they believe is football. Now, a lot of that is a mirage for various reasons. One, yes, you can have teams go up the pyramid, but usually they only go so far. There are very few Leicesters. There are very few Atalantas. It doesn't happen a lot. It happens once in a while if a team just hits it right. It's not a frequent occurrence where a team from the fourth division goes up to the first. You could say it happens, what, once or twice every 20 years? You had, like, Mon like Monaco that. winning the league, you know, but look at that but team Monaco, that they had. But Monaco's has money. But this is, that's different. Yeah. Monaco has, like, actual money. <laughs> that's true. Behind them. They have, a, they have some money. They're not ask, They're not wanting for, for funds there. I'm talking about a club like, yeah, like Swansea, like Bournemouth, um, like a Sheffield Wednesday or something along that line where it's like, Yes, you can theoretically dream that you're going to become Sheffield, you know, Sheffield Wednesday can win the Premier League, but it's probably not going to happen in anyone's don't, life. Don't tell Cambridge United they can't make the Premier League. Yeah. I They're mean, yes, in now. theory they can. <laughs> in theory, but... But, the, but that's, the, the, that, that's the point, though, isn't it? The point is that you can dream yes. about that. as well, every, also, every season when you're watching terrible football, you can think one day that can happen, but obviously the Super but, League... But, but Cancel that's that. not a sound financial model. Right? That's, <laughs> that's not true. a sound business model. That's certainly true. That's, yeah. the fans, that's the fans holding on to a dream. Yeah. And that's really what happened here. It, it, in a weird way, the dream won. And the dream never wins in these situations. The reality usually wins. Oh, but come on, it, come on Mark. A, you're, take, a, you're, you're taking me down here. Man. No, but it's, <laughs> it's a nice story. It is. Because the dream is 
really the core mm -hmm. of what football fandom is. That's the core. That's the heart. And when these clubs decided to break away, you're threatening to rip that core out. Whether that core be a reality or not is quite it's irrelevant. It's what you be it's what you believe in what you feel. And that's usually what you act on. Most of the time you don't act on the logic. You act on the on the heart and the emotion that you have for something. And people genuinely love football in a way that I don't think American fans love their sports. I think you can love the New York Giants, you can love, you know, your college football team, you can love the, the New York Yankees or you can love the Boston Red Sox. It's different than being a fan of Liverpool or Arsenal where your grandfather was a fan and your great grandfather was a fan and they've been going to the games for 80 years. It's just not the same thing. Yeah. So the, a lot of the stadiums you, are in the neighborhoods where people grew up and their family have yeah. been for generations and yeah. And, and and you know this is sort of a mild tangent but a lot of that was lost in the American sports because in the 60s and 70s a lot of the the, the teams moved out to the suburbs. They moved to these big sort of palaces out in the middle of nowhere. And you lost that sort of in the middle of a city, in the heart of a city kind of thing. Arsenal has not left the city. You know, Tottenham didn't, you know, Tottenham didn't move their team out to the suburbs of London. Like they're in where they've been for 120 whatever years. So I think in England, especially that heart of football was threatened. And I think it's like, a, it, you know, everyone came together to defend football. Mm -hmm. And there's something, if not naive, I'll say naive would be the sort of the, the cynical view of it. But I think admirable would be the positive view of it. And it's, a, it's an admirable um, position to take to fight for it like that. Yeah. And to show that... Um, you know, that the, the heart is still there. The core of what it is to be a football fan still exists. And it's going to take a lot more than a press release and sort of a weird, you know, multicolored logo <laughs> with white mm -hmm. lettering to take that away from, you know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> allow us to dream a little bit. We've got the Champions League. Apparently that's going to continue on. Um I kind of hoped that those Super League teams would be kicked out, but that didn't happen. It was unlikely with TV contracts. I get it. we got to play those games. So if you look at the Manchester City tie, uh, the first match is at the park. How do you guys see this one playing out? Matt, have you given a lot of thought to this one yet, or are you still not there yet? You're not sure yet? Um, I, I haven't. I have to say it's, it's weird to be talking about football again because it does feel like the whole thing has been dominated yeah. this week by – everything else basically around the game it's but, taken um, the yeah, wind no. out of the sails hasn't it it's like it's hard yeah. it's you don't even realize it's the semifinals but yeah, it's no, gonna it's... be really on tuesday real madrid are gonna play um uh chelsea mm -hmm. and they're gonna walk out on think they think really think about it they're gonna walk <laughs> out of the tunnel they're gonna line up and then they're gonna play the champions league music while these two clubs that literally nine days beforehand had tried to leave to form their own Super League, have to stand there. Yeah, Like, that's going to happen, and that's going to be super weird. <laughs> so, just, you know... <laughs> yeah. And especially if there would be fans in the stands, that would be... I couldn't imagine what that reaction would be like a if they're playing booing. that game. I can't imagine. <laughs> It'll be a lot of booing. Yeah. But the park will be yeah. empty, but, I mean, Matt, how do you see this one playing out? Um, I think it's a really hard one to call, isn't it? Because um, I think Man City have been really in the groove of late. Uh, and, um, yeah, I don't know. We're certainly going to have to... We're certainly having a hard route to the final, if indeed we are going to make the final this year. So um, I think it'll probably be quite cagey. I'm really uh, interested to see what Guardiola comes up with to deal with Neymar and Mbappe. I suspect it won't be that similar to Bayern Munich's plan, which always seemed quite suicidal. Um, but... I think I don't I don't there's nothing to fear as far as I'm concerned I don't really think we've got anything to worry about. we have got there there are things to worry about with Man City but I don't think we should have an inferiority complex with any of these teams really and um you know I think we've seen in previous um installments of the Champions League that they 
can be got at in these kind of particularly these high pressure games Guardiola has a tendency to kind of overthink things and come up with these really elaborate plans and um you know we can only hope that maybe he's uh, he's had a bit of time to think about it and he comes up with some crazy scheme that we can uh, we can we can we can exploit the advantages of uh, we can find the flaws but um i'm kind of quite looking forward to it it feels like we might be in better shape this time obviously marquinhos and verratti back in training this week so depending on how they do in the next few days i feel like as long as we can get a reasonably strong team out there on the pitch we've got a good chance of uh, of taking the lead into the second leg so yeah i'm 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 moderately confident, yeah. as confident as you can be, but I'm really looking forward to it. It should be a great match. Yeah, it should be good. Mark, I know you've gone on quite a bit about this on Twitter, but what do you think? Neymar's extension? Are we finally going to get the official announcement maybe prior to kickoff in the first leg? I, I don't know <laughs> if that's exactly good form to do that. I don't know. I think that's like, that's that just feels like jinxing it a bit. Like, they 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 make this announcement before the game and then he goes out and you know stinks like that wouldn't be a great look. I I've always been of the opinion that you announce you're a you're a club you when something's done you announce it you don't sort of wait for a special announcement like you know keeping it like everyone knows this is PSG this point, though they make an announcement of everything. Yeah, but it's just I know, yeah. but I I, I, yeah. I, I, still, call, I still don't think it's I I, I never liked when they. Um, you know, kept the the Pochettino thing for mm-hmm. for a week. It was like I, I I just I don't like I don't like when clubs do that. It's yeah. just my personal preference. You know, it's not illegal. So, but I I, I think I talked a little bit about the game in the 1970. But mm-hmm. I'll, I'll just I'll just kind of reiterate if it's sort of a new audience. I think PSG have more talent, raw, natural. You know. A, they're, they're more athletic team. They have faster athletes. They have, you know, they have, I think, a strength advantage, a size advantage. Man City sort of plays a, a, a more finesse uh, kind of, of older, you know, sort of, I guess it's old school at this point to say a, a sort of a Barcelona mid 2000, you know, 10, 2011 kind of game. But, you know, City can can carve you up when you're not, uh, when you're not doing what you need to do, when you're not, focused and you're not um and you, you you start chasing the ball and they start picking passes behind you so it's it, it's about discipline with them it's about staying in the lanes it's about taking away the taking away the direct pass forcing them to work around the outside and i i, I don't think city have it in their dna to sort of do what some teams do against PSG where you sort of sit back and try to swallow up neymar when he drives and send two three guys at him i think that I think they're just going to play it straight up and go our best against yours. Let's see what happens. I don't think there's going to be, be too much strategy in this because yeah. we know what, you know, Pochettino and Guardiola know each other very, very well. I don't think there's any se- secrets or surprises they're going to throw at each other that they haven't already seen. Mm-hmm. So it's just, you know, does PSG's approach to roster building, building around the big top names and, getting role players around them. Does that style win against a team like city who, you know, you look at them, as, as I said, if you have, a, if you let a top five list of players in this tie, I think PSG have four of the top five. I'd put De Bruyne in the top five for PSG. I put Neymar and Bappe Navas and Marquinhos in there. Mm-hmm. But if you went out and stretched it out to the top 12, top 15, I think city may have a few more players, maybe like seven to five, well, well Something speak, like that. speaking of players, I mean, do you, either one of you, and you can just chime in, I mean, do you see any surprises in the lineup? We had Mero Cardi scored a hat trick against Angers. Do you see him sneaking into the starting lineup? You look at right This back. is not an Akari game. No, it's okay. A, yeah, Would I you agree. go Dagba or Florenzi? <laughs> Matt, what do you I think? Just, <laughs> who's in, is, it, is Florenzi healthy? If Florenzi's healthy, I want Florenzi in. Yeah. Because he can put a cross in, he can he can make things happen down that wing. Dagba's been solid for what he's needed to do, but uh, again, he's not a spectacular player. Like, I, I again, give me the better player in that situation. Yeah. Uh, so we'll we'll see, but yeah, as I was saying, I just don't think this is a game for Acardi. I think mm-hmm. Acardi needs to be in the box. He needs to be given service and i just think with neymar and mbappe out there making runs i just think he kind of gets in the way like moist keen knows how to like stay out of their way and and work on channels when he needs to 
win a ball in the air when he has to. So, yeah, I, I don't see this as an... Uh, Icardi's not going to start these games, I don't think. All right. Yeah, I do agree yeah. with that. Mm-hmm. And I don't think Icardi will start either. At the same time, as you mentioned, I think that one of the things you can do with Man City sometimes is rough them up a bit. And I think maybe we do need to consider whether we start one of the more, whether it's Keane or, or Icardi, someone who's a bit better in the air or a bit better, who's got that bit of movement and who can pull their pull their centre-backs around a bit. But I tend to think he's probably going to go with the sort of, with Neymar and Mbappe and, and Di Maria, because, well, it worked pretty well last time, didn't it? And um, yeah. Di Maria seems to be uh, enjoying himself at the moment. Uh, what, so, about the yeah. midf- what about midfield? You said rough him up, so Parade is definitely in your starting eleven. Yeah, I think... <laughs> Again, it's really hard because Gay had such a good game yeah. last um, last time uh, when we in the second leg against Bayern Munich. But if Verratti and Paredes are both uh, fit, I just kind of like having them in there together. And I think Paredes is passing to uh, you know start the quick counter attacks is could be quite could be quite handy here. So yeah, I think I'd be tempted to start the two of them together because it's. I don't know if it's going to be a game for Gay or not. Man City are so technical and so, like, they have such good rotation that um, I wonder if it might be a bit difficult for him to make an impact. But as I say, you can kind of look at it both ways, can't you? If you put him in there, he does disrupt things. And when he's on top of his on top of his game, there's there's few better in Europe at, at yeah. playing that role. Yeah. But I think we can agree these are good problems to have. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I mean, for the first time in a long time, PSG have a midfield that is... Again, it's not the best midfield in the world, but they have options. There's actual options. Like, they can play to the style that they need to play in any given situation with what they have. And I think, you know, we don't know with Verratti. We really don't know if he can give you a full 90 minutes at this point. Like, it, I guess, it might I guess we'll find out uh, the game tomorrow against Mets. Um, yeah. I don't know if he's in the squad or not, but... He's, I think he's in. Yeah, I think he's in. see if he gets a few minutes. Yeah. Does he go a full 90 mm-hmm. when, you know, it's, he hasn't really gone a full 90 in a while. So he's coming off, he's coming off the COVID. So I don't know if he was ever really symptomatic with it, but still sometimes it takes players a week, you know, a couple weeks to sort of get their, their strength and energy back. And if Verratti can go 60 minutes, you know, Adrisa Gay comes on those last 30 minutes and, and is disruptive and you're, if you're in the lead, you're going to need to defend a lot anyway. So it might be good to, again, good good problems to have. Yeah, you want to have you a good have bench. somebody like Adrisa Gay that you could throw on there. Yeah, Sarabia too. He could maybe come in. So we, it's a deep squad. We're getting healthy at the right time. You know, I got to ask you guys. I, I got a prediction for the first leg. What do you think? I, I did a podcast with the Blue Moon podcast, if I'm not mistaken, the Manchester City one. Um, and I gave a prediction of 1-1. I said, well, let's leave it all for the return leg and see what happens. It should be a fun shootout. But what are you guys thinking for the first game? Um, I think that we will take a 2-1 lead into the second leg. I'm pretty confident we can score. And I think as well, like, Man City's game against Dortmund in the last round was very fine margins. Like, And we're obviously quite a lot better than Dortmund. Um, but they could have, you know, they could have easily gone out there on another day, the goal in the first leg that was... Uh, disallowed in very controversial circumstances and I think they had a penalty in the second leg didn't they and um, one maybe the keeper should have done better with so I don't think they're unbeatable and I'm pretty conf- well as confident as you can be that we can take something into their into the second leg so yeah 2-1 and Mark, yeah prediction um I tend to agree with Matt I okay. think there's a chance PSG can get a third in this mm. if City start to press forward um, that road goal helps them if they're able to get it because, uh, again, obviously it's a you get the you get the second leg at home. If you get a road goal on the first leg at, on the road, it, it it helps you. And I don't think PSG should be playing tentatively because of that. You know, I, I think PSG should go for as many as they can get. <laughs> so, like, it it's hard to keep cities off the board. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to keep PSG off the board. It's two teams yeah. that when they're playing well are three to four goal game teams and you don't want it to get that high. I think if you're PSG, you'd rather the score stay around two, nothing, three, one, two, one. You don't want to get into the four, three, five, you know, five, three range where they get those three road goals. And then, then you're sort of in a corner where you then have to start going for road goals yourself. And then they start countering you and it's just, 
it could get if messy. you're PSG, you, you want to keep this game fairly comfortable mm-hmm. and um get extend it. You know, you don't you, you, you again. You can't. It's hard to. I I don't think P, let's do it this way. In this specific situation, I don't think PSG can win like this tie in the first leg. I think they can lose it in the first leg. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, and I think it, just in, in this situation because you don't have because again, second games on the road. So whatever that means in in COVID times, I don't know. But it does mean something when you count the goals. And let's so not under be- est- let's not underestimate the fact that I think this is conspiracy theory. But I think UEFA <laughs> is going to tell the officials, "No, we need PSG to go through." Don't here. go there. We cannot there. have on, Real Madrid, for there. example, dancing around with our trophy. I think if there's a handball, maybe VR, VAR like has a glitch and doesn't work, and they missed it or something. I think yeah. UEFA is going to do everything no, they can to get don't, PSG don't into do the that. final. Don't do that. <laughs> I'm just saying, Man City were the first <laughs> team to pull out. Yeah, remember that. But they were still in it. Yeah, well, reluctantly. and they'll do it again. They say reluctantly. <laughs> I'm just I, saying. Honestly, and, 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 I, and I'll just say this yeah. too. Notice how no one's talking about this being the oil derby anymore. Oh my <laughs> god! Remember, god. like that was going to be the story. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure there were going to be about ten or twenty long form Bleacher Report, you know, That's think so pieces about. They're going to do it anyway. This, yeah. How this, fixture is an example of how football has lost its way Mm -hmm. and sovereign wealth fund and now real fans and all they are are marketing brands and then the super league (laughs) happened and now psg are the and i guess we didn't mention this when we talked about Mm -hmm. the super league and i think it's kind of important to bring this up a little bit you know before we go which is you know what a week for psg and nasser al halifi like what a perfect way to just weasel your way into the you know being what the third or fourth most powerful person in European football at this point. It's not a bad like, place he, to be. Literally, he just said he just said I'm going to sit on the sidelines. We're not going to put our name into this until we see that it might work, and it clearly didn't. So now he jumps over uh, Andre Agnelli and Florentino Perez mm-hmm. and all these people as like the the most powerful club owner in European football. And you're just looking at this, like how the hell does this happen? And not only this, but from the Neymar buyout to Mbappe, Nasser and PSG, they're just smarter than everybody else. It's like whatever PSG you're doing, just follow what they're doing. Either smarter or not as dumb. And I do think yeah. it, it's not necessarily a distinction <laughs> without a difference. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, Nasser does seem to have profited by basically doing nothing, just sitting there and being like, oh, you can all fall on your own swords and I'll just uh, sweep in afterwards. So, yeah, it has been, in terms of reputational stuff for PSG, it does seem to have been quite a good week. Um, we also didn't mention during our Super League discussion that the Champions League reforms were voted through sort of at the same time as this uh, Super League uh, kerfuffle was going on which as as far as I can tell are not that great to be honest like I quite like the Champions League format as it is and certainly don't think that it will benefit from having more games there's so, like 700 while, games like I am yeah, exaggerating exactly. but it's ridiculous no, no no you're probably not exaggerating that much so while we should be happy that the Super League's not happening I think we shouldn't be uh under any illusions that uh UEFA are the are the, are the good guys here because they are materially going to make the Champions League worse even if you know even if Nasser is on board well, there and he's rubber stamping with everything. The, with yeah. the rules that everyone agreed to, and yeah. then all those clubs pull out at the last minute yeah. after they agreed to all the rules that they got. <laughs> I so can't wait like, for the uh, the 30 for 30. I don't know if they have those in England, Matt, but 30 for 30 is like this documentary series from ESPN. where they go, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 30 for 30 on the 48 oh, hours of the a, Super League. This is absolutely going to be a... <laughs> A, a cautionary tale that will be told and with all the, you know, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of these owners will not want to, you know, go on camera with this because mm-hmm. this was pretty bad. Again, Florentino will be glad to talk. He'll be 80 years old. He'll be even less coherent. Than <laughs> he, he doesn't is care. Now. When I'm 80, I'm just going to say whatever. I don't care. What are you going to do to me? I'm 80 years old. Like, yeah. you can't cancel me. So, yeah. 
<laughs> that's when PSG talk can get really interesting when I'm doing this. Yeah. 80. <laughs> That'll be, that's when you can really start with the conspiracy theories. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just laying the groundwork right now. It's, yeah. it's wicked whispers. It's going to be right. great. All right, guys. Well, we're coming up on the end of the show. Let's just, uh, Mark, how can people find you on Twitter if they want to tell you how wrong you were about anything you said today? Well, if they would like to do that, they could find me at Mark Damon 9 All right, Mark Damon 9 And then, Matt, how can people find you? You can look me up on Twitter as well, at PSG Tourists, and I'll be happy to, uh, happy to join the discourse. Fantastic. And I am always at PSG Talk. We've got a game tomorrow, PSG Mets, another crucial league on battle enjoy it we don't get these all the time um and then um yeah next week we've got psg manchester city it'll be exciting we'll see what happens i always get the butterflies for these big games uh, it'll be exciting um and then i think maybe before that we'll probably do another preview show for um, psg's official twitch channel we'll get some of the guys on and uh, we'll, we'll talk some more football mm-hmm. manchester city champions league all that good stuff we'll probably leave the super league alone for a little bit and get back to the good stuff yeah so well thank you all for listening um and we'll catch you next time see everyone